Hello, and welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and today the Poison Pen is delighted to have with us virtually author Georgie Blaylock, whose new uh, book. Oh, I... hello, sorry. <laughs> That's right. I'm Blay... Blaylock? No? Blaylock, yes. Blaylock, uh, whose new book is An Indiscreet Princess. Before we begin today, I would like to let those tuning in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of Georgie's um, historical novels, as well as copies on order of An Indiscreet Princess, and we would be happy to hold one or more for you or put them in the mail. Just give us a call or go online, and we would, would be happy to connect you with these wonderful historical novels. And now I'd like to welcome Georgie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for visiting us virtually. I always like to find out about authors a little bit about them before they became writers. And you have kind of a fascinating background to your life story. Can you tell us a little bit about Georgie? Yes. So uh, originally I wanted to be a screenwriter. And so my uh, my undergraduate degree is in TV and film. And I ended up uh, moving to Los Angeles and taking a crack at the industry. And I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of, you know, a couple jobs up there that I really enjoyed. I worked for Sony Pictures. I worked for the Screen Actors Guild. Oh. But it's a very, you know, competitive yeah. industry. And uh, even though I had written for a small TV station in San Diego where I live, I never really had that happen for me in Los Angeles. And so when I was working at the Screen Actors Guild, I had a compressed work week. So I had Wednesdays off. Mm -hmm. And I ended up one day, I was sitting down, I was reading a romance novel, and I thought, wow, I could write one of these. And so I did. And so over time, that became, uh, under the name Georgie Lee, I wrote historical romances. And it, uh, after I left LA, I sold to Harlequin and I wrote 16 or 17 books for them. Huh. And then around, uh, and that was under the name Georgie Lee. And they're still out there if anybody wants to check them out. And then around 2016, I decided I wanted to make a change that I wanted to do historical fiction so that I could explore, you know, different time periods and maybe come at it with a different approach. And so uh, my first historical fiction book was The Other Windsor Girl, which is a story about Princess Margaret. Mm -hmm. And it's told through the eyes of a uh, fictional second lady in waiting. And it kind of follows her from 1949 to 1959. So between her uh, love affair with Captain Townsend all the way through to her marriage. And then my second book was The Last Debutantes and my current one, is uh, the indiscreet prince an indiscreet princess? Um, your first historical novel, The Other Windsor Girl, you um, created your fictional character. Character, you made her a romance writer too. Is that correct? I did. Was I did because. Of, pardon? Was that kind of an, a little bit of an homage to your career in romance writing? Yes and no. I think it was mostly just because it was something that she could do quietly on the sly. Uh, uh, because in the book, it's all about her having to kind of make her own way and find her own place in the world. Uh, and so she's writing these books on the sly and I needed something that, you know, you know, people kind of heard of and understood and at the same time that she could do very quietly. I think you've written that Princess Margaret was kind of the Princess Diana of her day. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that? One of the things I discovered when I was researching the other Windsor girl is how intrusive the press was with Princess Margaret. And that was something that we don't think about in the late 1940s. You, I don't know why we don't, but we don't. And so it was fascinating to see how she was very glamorous compared to her sister. Her sister's very regal. She was very glamorous. And people really responded to that. And because of that, in the way that Princess Diana was glamorous and people responded to it, the media would follow her and they could be very intrusive at times. There's a story where she was on the Isle of Capri. She was swimming in a very uh, light colored swimsuit and the paparazzi were on the shore with the wide angle lenses taking pictures of her. And if you Google it, you can actually see there's a Life magazine article from that time talking about how she was swimming nude and she wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they had people during that same um, Italy trip breaking into her. It was a maid that slipped into her or took a reporter into a room so that they could see what she was reading, what nail polish that she was using. So in that regard, she was very much the Princess Diana of her time. I don't think she had quite that common touch that Princess Diana had, but the glamour, that bringing that sense of awe that people really respond to, to the monarchy is something she definitely had. And you followed this uh, book up with The Last Debutante and if I understand correctly, that was inspired by a documentary that you saw? Yes, 
There's a great documentary. It's on YouTube. It originally aired in Britain and it's called The Debutantes in 1939 or uh, something like that. And it's all about that last debutante season before World War II. And the story for the last debutantes, when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is fascinating. And I started digging and seeing like which character I wanted to tell this story through because it's such an interesting time. It's that last hurrah of the old Mountain Abbey world before World War II comes and basically sweeps it away. There's still little vestiges of it left. So when I write the other Windsor girl, you see a little bit of it, but that full Downton Abbey kind of world, it's just gone after that. And so when I started doing the research, I noticed that Neville Chamberlain, who was the prime minister at the time, he was the prime minister before Winston Churchill. Um, he's the peace in our time prime minister. Mm -hmm. His niece was a debutante during that time. And she, was based at Downing Street, number 10 Downing Street. Okay. And Neville Chamberlain's wife, Anne Chamberlain, was the one who sponsored her. And she had this fascinating story too, because she was related to Neville Chamberlain through um, her aunt. It was her aunt's brother who was her father. And he, she was someone who was born into that Downton Abbey world, but because her father uh, bankrupted himself, I mean, he died in a hovel in France, literally. Okay. And because he bankrupted himself, he pulled her out of that world so by birthright she was allowed to be in it but money wise and status wise and time wise she wasn't and so that was very much a book about you know a changing time changing era questions about the future dealing with the past and that's something she has to deal with because she's thrust from this very obscure background into the world of this, the season which is suddenly these girls that have been isolated are suddenly the center of attention and they're expected to you know sink or swim <laughs> I found it fascinating because I guess I had a preconceived notion about debutantes and the social season, like parties and shopping and all this light frivolous thing. It was really kind of the equivalent of boot camp for these women. It was because most of them were raised at the country houses or they'd had very sheltered upbringings. And what happens with the season is, yes, it's there to also find a husband, but it's also to train these girls. You would learn how to talk to people suddenly you go from talking to no one that every night you're talking to different dance partners, you're talking to different people of all kind of levels and background well, within the upper, you know, the aristocracy, mm -hmm. you know, but you're, you're having to learn how to carry yourself. You're having to learn how to talk to people, how to plan parties, how to do all these things that girls at the time that when they then got married, were going to need to do these things, especially young women who became wives of um, members of parliament or ambassadors or anything like that. These entertaining and talking to people and being able to function in the social world was a very important thing they needed to learn. And the season was very much there to teach them that. Hmm. And that brings us to your new book, which is coming out at the end of September, An Indiscreet Princess. What can you tell us about that book? So An Indiscreet Princess is about Princess Louise, who was Queen Victoria's fourth daughter. She had nine children and she was the fourth daughter. And she was the most rebellious. She was an artist, but she wasn't just an artist. It was very acceptable at that time for women to paint or do watercolors. She was a sculptor and she was good at it. And that was considered a very masculine art. But because it had been her father, Prince Albert's favorite medium, he had encouraged her and had encouraged her um, desire to study it before he died. And this is all about her instead of conforming to the role of the quiet princess who just sits there and gets married and makes a political alliance and kind of just goes along with everything, she fights for a life of her own. And she does it at a very fascinating time. She becomes the first royal to attend a public school ever. She ends up going to the National Art Training School, but she's doing it at a time when you have the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, you have James McNeil Whistler, later, a little bit later, John Singer Sargent, these absolute luminaries of the art world. And she becomes friends with them and she encourages them and she gets to know them. And then at the same time, she has an affair, uh, a very long lasting um, love affair with a gentleman named Just Joseph Edgar Bohm, who was a very famous artist at his time. He has since faded. It's, it was really hard at that time to sort of stand out from the crowd. Um, and he did at the time, but because he died somewhat early, um, he just didn't leave the same lasting legacy. But if you go to the Natural History Museum in Britain, his statue of Charles Darwin is there. If you go to Hyde Park, uh, no, sorry, if you go to Holland Park, his statue of Lord Holland is there. And if you go to Kensington Gardens, 
Princess Louise's statue of Queen Victoria is still standing there. And so it's all about her trying to create this life for herself within the confines of what's expected of her as a royal princess, but also sort of breaking out of that and sort of becoming, not to use this again, but you know, the Princess Diana of her time, because she had much more of a common touch. She was able to straddle the world of the, the royalty and the aristocracy and commoners. None of the artists that she was friends with, uh, I mean, they went on to gain titles, but they did not start out that way, or very few of them. It was a fascinating book in many ways, but in one sense, um, when you think about her going to the National Art Institute, was it? The National Art Training School, which is National. now the South, that became the South Kensington Art School, now it's part of the Victoria and Albert. Um, in some time, in some periods, women, especially aristocratic or upper class women, always had to be protected with companions or maids or all these people to make sure their reputation was pure in a sense, but she was going to these schools and she was kind of on her own with all these, I guess you could call them the rogues of their era. Yes, yes, she was. And it did cause issues. I, it was not easy, um, especially you know later on, because even when she does become married, because she eventually marries the son of the, the, first, the oldest son of the Duke of Argyle. And even though she was married, as a married woman, you're not supposed to be going to these things by yourself. And that does become an issue in the book as well, that you know, you're supposed to have a companion. And it, it actually did become an issue in her real life because uh, it, this happens outside of the book, but she was in, uh, she and Joseph Edgar Bohm had an, a relationship for years and he died in 1890 and she was the one who found him. But there's a lot of speculation about in what sort of situation was she there when he died? Were they in a compromising position when he died? Why was a married woman there by herself? And it became such an issue that the Queen Victoria had to step in. They had to release an official version of it to the press. It almost became a scandal. And this is all while she's grieving the loss of someone that she really loves. Mm -hmm. And so she does do these things, but it's a really... It's a, it could be a very difficult path for her to walk because of her position. One of the other fascinating things about the book was you take her to Canada, which I'd never known. So that was fascinating to learn, but she really kind of tried to foster the artistic environment there too. Was that something that was true to history or? Yes, that is true. She, her husband became the governor general of Canada and she went with him and she started, I'm, I'm probably gonna get the name wrong, but it's like the Royal Academy of Canadian Arts, and mm -hmm. it's still a gallery there today. So her good friend, um, Henrietta Montalba, if you Google that, there's a painting of her that Princess Louise did that's in that gallery. And yes, the paintings that I mentioned in the book of um, James McNeil Whistler's being in that gallery are actually in that gallery. Mm -hmm. And her time in Canada and America was actually a lot longer in real life than I was able to include in the book. Um, I had to kind of condense things, you know, for the narrative because it is fiction after all. Mm -hmm. um, but she actually ended up touring uh, a lot of America. She even made it out as far as uh, um, Santa Barbara out here in California oh. and places like that. So she really traveled. And it's so, yeah, that's all true. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about your way of researching your books because I find it fascinating. Um, you strike a perfect balance, and I think if I'm correct, you said walking or writing historical fiction can sometimes be a tightrope walk between presenting the past as it actually was and presenting the past as people believe it to have been. Yes, because, you know, through movies and what people have read, they expect certain things. So one of the things that I found as a challenge when I was writing An Indiscreet Princess is I think people's perception of Queen Victoria is very much shaped by movies like Her Majesty Mrs. Brown, things like, you know, Judy Dench, basically. Yeah. And she's kind of this choralist but lovable grandma figure. And I think that's kind of what people think of the older Queen Victoria. And the reality is she was kind of an unpleasant person. Mm -hmm. She was queen and mm -hmm. she knew it. And she was the center of her universe. And she very much demanded that everybody, including her children, recognized that, catered to that. And so, especially after Prince Albert dies, there's nobody to sort of stop, kind of check her, I guess, and say, hey, you know, there's other people and maybe you shouldn't be. So you've got a person who 
every time she just makes a suggestion, people take it as this is the law, not, you know, not the law, but this is the way it needs to be. And you need to do this. People don't push back against her. So what happens is with her children, especially she rules them with an iron fist and she can be incredibly jealous mm -hmm. with them. And when I was writing and I was, I went through and I read biographies of her, but I also read her journals and her letters. There's a great correspondence available in books between her eldest daughter's daughter, Vicky, who was, um, it could be Empress of Germany and Queen Victoria. And you get mostly both sides of that conversation. And, you know, like her daughters lose their children and she's like, well, you've got more. It's mm -hmm. not as bad as losing a husband. You know, it's always, it's always about her. Mm -hmm. And so when I was doing that research, I realized, wow, if I just put that in the book, people are going to think I'm making that up. So one of the things I did is I went through her journals and found these quotes so at the beginning of every chapter or section to kind of set the stage for what was going to happen in the chapter, I used those quotes so that people could see for themselves that she could be really nasty mm -hmm. and almost in a shocking way that you would think that if I hadn't sort of done that, I think people would think I made it up and I didn't. Mm. Was she different when she was married to Albert is, can I believe the PBS Victoria series that she was at one point kind of happy? <laughs> She was because he, she was, she was in love with him to the point that she kind of excluded everything else. So, but he was there as a pretty good balance to her. So, you know, she's queen. She's got things that she has to do. She can't always be paying attention to the kids. So Albert is very good about paying attention to that because he had a horrific childhood. His mother had an affair and the, she was banished and he stopped. He had been very close to her. And after he was five, she he never, I think he saw her one more time after that before she died. So he had had this kind of awful childhood. So he made for them a very good childhood. He, he paid attention to them. He was really invested in their education. So he was very much there and he would tell the queen to not be so mean to them or to pay more attention or to do these sort of things. She didn't always listen to him. Yeah. But once he died and it became all about her grief, it it just became all about her. Right. The almost exclusion of almost everything. And if you didn't play into that as her family member, as one of her ministers, as all that, uh, she didn't take to that too well. Right. So there weren't a whole lot of people there to kind of tell her to, okay, you know, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you do a really good job. You do kind of soften the edges of her a little bit too. And I also, what I thought interesting to me as a reader was kind of the parallels with the current monarch, monarch between these, the push and pull between wanting a personal life and the responsibilities of being a monarch because you might want to do things, but like Elizabeth II, you have duties you have to follow through on too. Yeah, they're they're just in such a unique position. And I think that's where Princess Louise got very lucky in that she was able to pursue her art. Because one of the things in the other Windsor girl, the problem with Princess Margaret is that mm -hmm. if, if she and Elizabeth had been men, you know, she, Princess Margaret probably would have been given some kind of career, probably in the military. Mm -hmm. But because she was a woman at that time, you're still in that transition period. The war's over. You're not really into the sixties yet. It's, she's just stuck in that limbo where they don't know what to do with her and they don't give her anything to do. And then she doesn't get married. So she doesn't have, you know, that to kind of focus on. So she ends up just becoming lost. And then all these things she wants to do like marrying Captain Townsend, she cannot do. And so I think princess Louise kind of got a little luckier in that respect is that she was able to do more of what she wanted to do. She was able to have an art career. Now it was tempered because mm -hmm. of her position. And she probably, if she'd have been able to just dedicate full time to it, you more people would probably know about her uh, because she did, but she showed in galleries. And that was unheard of. Cause that's one of the things in the book is that that she's really, Quentin Victoria is horrified by the idea that she's going to be out there competing with artists, but she does, but she always has to find a way to do it. So, you know, she enters things, she enters things in galleries, but it has to be like for charitable things. So, so she just finds a way around it. And I think in a lot of ways, she actually had more freedom than Princess Margaret. I think you're probably true. I also think it was interesting because um, Princess Louise got, I guess, static from people in the art world who 
basically said the only reason you're getting your pieces shown and sold and brought to attention is because you're a royal. She had to fight against that perception too. She did, but it, it also kind of in some ways works her favor because you know, when you when you're friends with the princess, mm -hmm. you, you your chances of getting noticed by the queen who can further your career or your chance of getting that sort of status also helps. So yeah, it's a sort of a double-edged sword for her because yes, people don't think she should be there. And there was, when I did the research, there was a lot of people who said that at the time that she was only there because of who she was, that she was, there were some rumors that she was leaving Bohm, Joseph Edgar Bohm to do her work to finish up. Like she would start a piece and then leave him to finish it or that he was mm -hmm. actually doing it. So yes, people did, people, you know, were, I guess, jealous or that people yeah. cast doubt on her career, but she didn't allow it to stop her either. And I, I think that's why she did. She tried to show and do as much as she could. And she wanted to prove, no, this is me. And she went on for years and, and did more than what I covered. Yeah, no, but you do provide a fascinating window into the art world of the time. And you have all these cameos from people you mentioned, like Whistler. And um, I had forgotten that he had that huge trial that almost yes. ruined him. As yes, artist. he did. Well, he went out of his way to kind of make people irritated at him. He had a knack for it. You but it was <laughs> yeah but it was fun because i didn't realize that she was involved you know that she knew him that well and so if you go in if you go through whistler's papers a lot of it's online uh the university i think it's birmingham has it you can look through them there's letters between him and princess louise and him and joseph edgar bohm and so it's kind of fun to see that friendship and it was also interesting just with how many people there were that she knew at that time because you know, it was one of those eras that just created so many people, you know, trying to pick and choose who to bring in and who to leave out because there were so many. And so because of Whistler's uh, good friendship with Boehm and Princess Louise, he was the one that gets kind of the most uh, attention in the book. Um, why do you think that you've written about royalty in different books? Why do you think readers are so fascinated with royal figures? I think there's a fairy tale aspect to it that people enjoy that we all know they don't have perfect lives but you know from the outside it looks pretty good and mm -hmm. i and i think we just are fascinated with that the idea i think that's also like in why down abbey did so well you're kind of fascinated with the idea of the big manor house and lots of servants and everything's really pretty and elegant and you know you don't just sit down to dinner it's just this silverware and there's it's just beautiful in a very classical kind of way that i think people like mm -hmm. and it's it, but it's also fantasy because, you know, you kind of imagine yourself sitting down to that big court's meal. You don't want to think about, you know, who's cleaning it up or am I going to have to clean the dishes later, you know? <laughs> so you can kind of lose yourself into that. And I also think that they, as characters or as people, it's, it is that interesting pull between what they're born to, which is super rare, but it has all these demands and what they want as people. So I think it also has a lot of really good juicy conflict that's, <laughs> you know, a lot of fun. And I think that's why you have all the, you know, went back when they had more of them and People Magazine kind of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you want you also you want to see all the beauty, but you kind of want to see, you know, well, what's going on behind that. You yeah, you also you want to you admire them, you want that lifestyle, but you also want to think, well, their life isn't as good as mine. And so yeah, it's, exactly. It's the push pull. Do you have a favorite royal figure of your own? Oh, Do you have one? Always the one I'm working with. <laughs> <laughs> just because I end up getting into, you know, so deep in their lives that, um, so I don't really have a favorite, but, you know, I have, uh, I'm very fond of Princess Margaret and Princess Louise because I have spent so much time with them and come to know them as people and my fictional versions of them that, you know, I, it sounds silly to say, but I think it's them just because I know so much and I've read so much. And for, so for me, they become more than just the magazine story. They've become real people who have real problems that they had to overcome or deal with. How do you, if you had to pick one or two um, media representations, movies, miniseries, which ones do you think are the capture the spirit of those royal personages the best? I think The Crown is an excellent one. Okay. I think that's a very good series that, especially if you want to see about Princess Margaret. Uh, if you get a chance to get a hold of it, Her Majesty Mrs. Brown for uh, about Queen Victoria is, I think, a very, very good um, kind of depiction of what's going on 
because uh, especially if you want to understand like the grief and kind of how it affected her and things like that. Um, I think those are two very good ones for people. Let's talk a little bit about your writing process. Um, I have a note here saying that the best at writing advice you have given or received is having established habits and routines, even old ones that you can fall back on, can make all the difference when life interferes with your writing. That is so true. Um, because part of people always say, well, I don't feel inspired to write. Well, you're never going to write if you wait for that. So if you get in the habit of sitting down every day, no, not every day. Okay, life gets in the way. Let's be realistic. Um, but if you get in the habit of on a regular basis, you sit down at your computer and you have that time, however it is defined for you, that when you sit in that space, you know, now I'm going to create, now I'm going to work. And then the other advice I give people is just write. Mm -hmm. Because once you start the process, some days it doesn't flow, but some days it does. But you have to start. You have to just sit down and do it. But having the routine is important because the thing about when I was writing the last debutante, my deadline for that was June of 2020. Mm -hmm. And in January of 2020, I had my writing schedule all set for how, you know that six months. And as we all know, in March, you know, the world went that crazy. Changed. Things changed. And suddenly, wow, you know, I still had to finish the book. And sitting down and having that routine that I could fall back on every day, that habit, it's a habit help me get through that. And that was one of the things that when I was talking to other writers is some of them then had to go back to old habits. So uh, especially for writers with children, if you've been writing when they were very young, you found ways to do that. And some people, when your kids are suddenly home doing Zooms, school, you have to go back to that. Sometimes it means, you know, if you've got really little ones writing during naps or getting up early. And these are all things that I've done in the past. And so once you sort of establish those patterns, it's easy to go back to them. And it also puts your, your mind in a certain space. When I sit down at my computer at this time of day with my drink and my whatever, it's time to write. And so your, your mind kind of knows that and, and, you know, things happen. Yeah, it's, t it's treating um, writing as a profession, as a responsibility, okay. as not just as kind of a fun a thing to do. Yes. So, yeah. Um, one of the other um, things you'd written about writing that I thought was fascinating is that you think classic Hollywood movies can teach writers today a lot about the craft. How so? I do. Um, a lot of what happens with the classic Hollywood movies is that they can't come right out and say what's going on because when the Hays Code comes in 1935 and suddenly, you know, you're not allowed to have two adults in the same bed, you're not, there's certain things you can't discuss. You know, they still want to discuss these things. You have to come up with really creative ways to do it. So if you can get a hold of the old Tyrone Powers, Gene Tierney, Razor's Edge, it's based on a Somerset Mon book. So it's a pretty heavy source material that deals with some really weighty issues that didn't necessarily translate well to the screen. So there's a scene where Gene Tierney, she is uh, engaged to um, Robert Taylor and he's going to leave and she doesn't want him to leave. And so she wants to get pregnant by him so that he won't leave. You cannot come out and say that back then. So if you watch that scene, it's completely clear what they're talking about, but it's very cleverly done with the dialogue. So if you wanna see about dialogue, these the old films, you know, the Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell, His Girl Friday, listen to the dialogue in that and how it snaps and it's crisp and it goes back and forth. And just a lot of the ways that they dealt with things that, you know, there was no CGI, there was no, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't come out and say everything. So they just have to be very creative. And I think those are definitely lessons that you can apply to your writing that, you know, especially when it comes to like subtext and getting your point across without just saying it flat out, especially when you're doing historical fiction, because mm -hmm. if you want to be true to the time, they can't always just come out and have these conversations because it wasn't allowed. It wasn't the thing. And so they had to be kind of, you know, subtext as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that it translates really well. I think you're right. I think it's also, it's really beneficial to historical fiction for modern readers because dialogue driven stories are much more acceptable to modern readers. If yes. you just simply text, it kind of slows them down. And some readers may find that a little bit more um, of a journey to make. Um, how do you make sure you're writing captures the flavor of the time period, especially for dialogue or language. Uh, do you watch movies from the period? Do you read novels? How do you capture that 
flavor. I, I read, I watch movies. I read, I like to also read whatever time period I'm working in. I try and find the um, memoirs or the autobiographies of people who lived at that time. Uh, so, so it's like with the last debutantes, there was practically nothing out there really available about Valerie Devere Cole. Mm -hmm. so in order to create her character, I had to read about people who were her contemporaries. And so a lot of the experiences or feelings I gave her are based on feelings that people wrote about. So uh, I think one of the ones that stands out is um, one of the Mountbatten, it might've been Edwita Mountbatten, um, and that she had been shipped off to boarding school and I don't think her mom ever visited her. Mm -hmm. And she, it, they talk about how lonely she felt and, and how that affected her. And so you could get a sense of how they expressed that and how they looked at that. And, and the other thing about you know, writing historical fiction dialogue is you have to give it the flavor, but you can't always be accurate mm -hmm. because, so I think that a good example of this is tripping the light fantastic. When we hear that phrase, mm -hmm. you don't think of the 1800s, you think of 1970s. Mm -hmm. The truth is that phrase is incredibly old. I can't remember whose uh, work it shows up in, but it shows up like two or 300 years ago in somebody's work. Hmm. But if you use that phrase, people are gonna like, why are you using a modern phrase in historical novel? So you do have to be aware of how you things sound. And even if it is accurate for the period, if it doesn't have that sound, or if it has somehow become something that's very much of a later time, you know, not using it. I, I think you're right. Um... Of course, we also have to remind readers it is fiction too, so writers do take some license. But I think that also um, illustrates the importance, and I like what you've done with your author's notes because that lets the reader know this is what I've done, this is what I've changed. Because if, if people are curious, you know, is this real? Did this really happen? And you know, you want to you want to kind of let them know that yes, this really happened, so they can go if they wish to pursue you know research on it and learn more about it. Yes, but if it's completely made up, you know, you also kind of want to know so that you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> they don't mention to someone and they say no, you're you're right. poppycock or something, or they just start trying to research it and find out that yeah, you know, oh, oh, that didn't happen. Bummer, you know. Um, let's change direction a little bit and talk about Georgie as a reader. Um, are there things that you've read that you'd like to share with other readers? What are some of your favorite books? So if they're reading um, An Indiscreet Princess, mm -hmm. a really good book is Lucinda Hoxley's um, Queen Victoria's Mysterious Daughter. Oh. Great biography of uh, Princess Louise. It really brings, I feel like that biography is brings her much more to focus as a person that's relatable and is it's a, it's a very lively biography. So uh, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, there's a good Princess Margaret book. I think it's called 99. It's been a while. 99 oh, Recollections. Yeah. It's yes. like the pictures or something and they talk about that. Yeah, and it's got quotes and you just realize that she was, wow. <laughs> she was way more scandalous than you realized. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, with fiction, sometimes I, I like, okay, so my favorite books are sort of these kind of odd, but The Stand by Stephen King is one of my absolute all-time favorite oh. books. Uh, I read that when I was in like high school, and I've read it numerous times since. I love that book. And then Watership Down, I love that book. That is, it's one of those books that everybody's like, it's kids' books. Like, it's not a kid's book. No. It's not a kid book by any stretch of the imagination. But because it's, it's about rabbits, everybody's like, oh, it's a kid's book. No, no, it's not. But it's it's just such an interesting novel that deals with these issues of rebuilding, rebuilding your life, facing all these life and death challenges, but from a really interesting perspective. Or if you, I think I, I read an article once about Richard Adams trying to pitch this book where he's like, yeah, it's about rabbits and they're rebuilding their warren and one of them's got uh, psychic powers. And it just <laughs> sounds totally crazy, but wow, it's such a wonderful book. Hmm. That's interesting because both those are examples of writers who have built worlds, these rich, mm -hmm. vibrant worlds. And it's kind of what you're doing with historical fiction. You're creating that time period, that world for readers. We're almost out of time, but before we do run out, um, what's next? Can you tell us what's next for you? Would you rather it remain a secret? 
Uh, right now, I'm I'm working on proposals, and so one of the ones that I'm working on, we'll see, is uh, about the Duchess of Windsor and the Duke of Windsor. The King of abdicated, and oh, I've been going I've been going down the rabbit hole of just how much they were collaborating with the Germans, and it's, it's shocking. It, it's shocking, and so I would I think I would like to do something that shows that because I think a lot of people think oh they abdicated they lived happily ever after. No, <laughs> yeah. not by a long shot. <laughs> That's the impression I got. And it's, I mean, I guess it's really hard to find anybody that can be sympathetic to them. As, I mean, I'm pretty much in the Queen Mary camp. It's like cut them off. Well, they just were their own worst enemies. Yeah. On every front you can imagine. It's, it's just, but it's shocking because that's, that's another one of these things where that's not how they're portrayed. Mm -hmm. It's portrayed as the greatest love story ever. He gave up the throne for her. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sort of. But mm, when yeah. you start to really dig into it, it gets, it gets dark, really mm. dark. So, so we'll see what happens with that. And how can readers learn more about you and your books? Are you on social media platforms? Do you have a website? I do. My re website is georgieblaylock.com. And I have a fun page there on all my books. So like on an indiscreet princess, I have pictures of, Princess Louise and her um, sculpture and Joseph Edgar Bohm and all those kind of people. And I have it for the other books uh, as well. And then um, I'm mostly on Instagram. So it's at Georgie Blaylock. Yeah. I love to hear. I've seen some lovely pictures of a dog on Instagram. Oh yeah. That's my writing parts or my little writing partner, my Shih Tzu. So uh, he hangs out with me and, you know, he lets me take his picture. <sighs> Uh, well, it's just been such a fascinating uh, half hour with Georgie Blaylock. Did I get that right? You did. Um, whose new book is An Indiscreet Princess. It's a fascinating book. All of her historical novels are. I think what I loved about your books was you hit the perfect balance for me as a reader between entertaining and learning stuff. You learn about the period. You learn these little facts. But you're also, it's just a story that you fall into and love. So if you're looking for something great to read, I would definitely say all three of them are top door historical fiction. I would like to thank Georgie for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I'd like to thank those of you tuning in to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore.